Hello and welcome to Risk Awareness Week 2021. My name is Robert Brown and I'm a Senior Strategy Analyst with the Global Automotive Division of Novellus Incorporated. And this year uh, I'm going to be discussing a concept that I've entitled Green Accountability and Incentives, Reflecting the Social and Economic Costs of CO2 and New Capital Projects. So before I go further, uh, I am going to turn off my video feed here so now that I've introduced myself. Um, and I'm just going to focus on the slides for the moment. Although I don't really have uh, a lot of slides, I'm going to spend most of my time walking through uh, a model that I've created, a sort of a toy model uh, that is somewhat representative of a large capital investment project that we recently uh, assessed here at Avellis. It has been anonymized. I will uh, tell you that up front. Uh, all the numbers have changed. All the many of the names of important uh, products and product, internal product lines have been changed, uh, pretty much to protect, uh, you know, our confidentiality interests. Um, but it should be reflective enough, I think, for you to get a good idea as to how we're beginning to think about this issue of what our carbon footprint is and what we can do to actually help control that, as well as to refocus our own incentives to choose those projects that are in line with our corporate goals uh, and values, as well as those of the larger uh, goals and values, uh, I think that we share here on planet Earth. Before I go a little bit further, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Novellus and what we do. Novellus is the world's largest manufacturer of aluminum flat roll product, and our products show up in a very wide array of both uh, customers uh, down uh, four primary uh, verticals. Primarily, we offer aluminum sheet and rolls, flat roll product that goes into beverage cans, uh, the automotive industry. So many of you are familiar with the Ford F-150 which contains a very large proportion of our aluminum and itself is what we call an, an aluminum intensive vehicle. Uh, we also, through our recent acquisition of uh, Alaris, are providing aluminum flat roll product to the aerospace industry. A number of specialty products uh, that are used in outside of our uh, three primary areas, but nevertheless actually contribute quite a bit to our overall business. This issue uh, of being aware of our environment and being good stewards within our environment is very important to us. We have the ambition to be the world's leading provider of low carbon sustainable aluminum solutions. So right now, uh, we are in fact one of the largest producers of aluminum that contains highly recycled content, which is very important because recycled aluminum possesses about 5% or contributes about 5% of the total CO2 burden and energy burden that non-recycled aluminum uh, generates. We intend to reduce our re uh, reliance on uh, the non-recycled aluminum that we do use. We still have to use some by 30% uh, by the year 2026. Uh, in addition to other, you know, socially responsible and environmentally responsible uh, areas of interest and focus. Now, this is not just, uh, I guess, promises that we are making on paper. We are actually putting our money where our heart is in the sense that in order to finance these various uh, initiatives to reduce the amount of CO2 in the production of our products, we are issuing green bonds. Uh, to finance these projects. And these green bonds, of course, uh, have certain uh, CO2 reduction targets associated with them. And so in order to um, satisfy the requirements of our green bond, we not only have to pay back that money associated with the financing uh, for these projects through the bond, uh, but we also have to certify that we've achieved various uh, uh, CO2 reduction targets associated with these projects. So all of this sounds great, but the real world shows up, of course. 
uh, it's not necessarily possible for us or any company for that matter to flip a switch and automatically transform their entire company uh, in a completely new direction or a, even a more responsible direction instantaneously. So we will have to do this, of course, in such a way that as we allocate dollars to these projects that we are pursuing, not only do we have to generate a rate of return that is still attractive to our shareholders, um, at the same time, of course, we still want to be uh, responsible and represent good stewards of the environment by producing you know, lower amounts of CO2 as we move forward in time. So the way we're thinking about this is to, first of all, uh, consider selecting projects, of course, according to a, a typical finance guidance, and that is to always choose alternatives that maximize the net present value uh, to the organization. So let me discuss a little bit about, first of all, how we go about doing that. Um, within the context of both normal project selection as well as those projects that are associated with the reduction of greenhouse gases. I'm going to flip over now to uh, the model that I'll be discussing to get us there, to get us the, to this understanding. And I'll be demonstrating this model to you in an environment called Analytica, which is a modeling environment that I have been using since 1996. Uh, it's a really powerful modeling environment that uh, allows you to build your models in the form of an influence diagram to help guide you through the abstraction of the problem that you're thinking about solving, uh, as opposed to creating procedural line code or, you know, more of a spreadsheet type environment. It gives you the ability to visualize the flow of logic so that you focus more on concepts first and then quantification later. Not that quantification is important, but it helps us to think about the problem as we're structuring it and framing it. Um, and then, of course, we can go in to that structure and add quantification to it. I've gone inside the model details and you can see the flow of the diagram here. Um, we have a certain capacity that we are trying to generate that capacity is going to influence the amount of supply that we can respond to. Uh, and then from the trade-off or the balance between the demand and the supply, that will lead us to a certain amount of contribution to the organization. In addition to that, in order to satisfy that supply, we would have to develop a certain amount of capital expenditure in order to generate the structure that produces the products that are aligned with the strategies that we are considering. And then finally, of course, each of these will produce some sort of operational cost. We are also considering in this particular case the possible divestiture of certain assets that are currently important to our portfolio, but maybe we would be considering uh, the effect that their age has on the overall CO2 production or greenhouse gas production that we're concerned about. And so, you know, we might think about uh, removing that from our portfolio and see how that affects the overall uh, strategic guidance. Let me dig in a little bit more uh, to this diagram with you. And specifically, um, I'll look at the supply portion. And you can see that what I've developed is a, a flow chart, essentially, again, this sort of influence diagram type structure that guides me through how various product lines uh, are producing our end product and intermediate products along the way. So we're not just concerned about the final output. Every piece of our production process has intermediate products and each one of those intermediate products as well has a certain footprint associated with it, not just in terms of the actual mass produced, but also in terms of the actual mass of the CO2 that gets produced. So as I follow this flow chart, uh, this will ultimately lead me to the total amounts of product in each one of those intermediate categories, as well as the final output categories. 
for the primary concerns uh, were within the product verticals that I described earlier. That is automotive production, uh, can production, and our specialties uh, production, which is uh, contained in the IPG uh, uh, nodes. Ultimately, of course, um, this supp uh, supply uh, combined with uh, constrained against the demand uh, produces a contribution set of calculations. And you'll notice in these contribution, in this contribution flow chart, that I've represented certain nodes with these ellipses, these light blue ellipses. These light blue ellipses are uh, nodes that carry uncertain information about them. In other words, behind these nodes, I will generate a Monte Carlo simulation of a distribution for that particular node and use those simulated values throughout the model uh, as it runs. You'll see a number of these uh, nodes as we walk through this model. But the point is, is that up to this point, in order to account for the CO2 that we produce, we have to account for all of the elements of our production process that are at least significant contributors to the overall CO2 footprint or greenhouse gas footprint that we are concerning ourselves with. Then each one of these elements are themselves generating uh, either a cost to us or a benefit to us in some way. We don't know precisely what those will be, and instead of trying to guess single point values, I will be representing those elements that we really don't know with precision with an uncertainty distribution so that in aggregate, in the aggregate effect of all of these uncertainties acting together, I can get an end view of what that effect is on that net present value calculation that we will use as our first pass to understand the value of the strategies that we may pursue. So ultimately, this gets me uh, to the value module, where as I follow the calculation of the volumes of mass produced in terms of our product and their intermediate contributors, uh, ultimately all this converges to a, another influence diagram that guides us through the accounting of cash, ultimately to get us down to a strategy net present value. So when I run this particular node uh, in Analytica, I get that set of curves that I was showing on uh, the slide. So here we are considering uh, approximately or seven different strategies in the pursuit of a capital allocation or a capital expansion uh, opportunity that we have. This opportunity, this expansion opportunity, as I pointed out, may involve some divestiture of certain assets. Uh, it involves improving the efficiency, the overall efficiency of our existing assets. Uh, it includes possibly um, taking the steps to expand our market share as well as maintain market share or, uh, you know, position ourselves in different kinds of ways in the market. And then ultimately, we are also going to be considering the effect of some of the um, improved use of recycled content. All of these strategies in some form or another contain those elements of consideration in the formation of those strategies. So as we look at this, we can see that the ultimate calculation of the net present value for these strategies produces quite a range. And we can see almost right away that there are certain strategies that are really not that interesting by comparison to the others. Namely, this strategy on the far left, what I have entitled here, uh, the keep the XYZ program, but internalize uh, basically hot print hot band production and then seek incremental bicycle sales of course again bicycle sales is representative of something else um, but you'll also see that we have these other strategies we might want to grow uh, the bicycle market as well as uh, also grow our uh, aluminum foil hat market so we have seven strategies is the end point 
and we can discard some of these because by comparison to some of the others, uh, they are not dominant or they overall do not present uh, a range of value that is any better uh, than some of the others. In fact, if we do look at this, uh, these set of risk curves, we can see that among those that are really the most competitive for consideration, uh, we, we are facing a, a bit of a trade-off uh, that we have to consider. And that is that even though on a median basis or even a mean basis, we can see that some of these strategies um, have a, about the same value in the upper tails and in the lower tails, we might see opportunities to take advantage or uh, mitigate risk uh, or do some things to promote or to, you know, uh, help us to manage the risk on the downside tails. But what this is basically showing us is that we now have uh, really three key strategies to focus on if we are considering only net present value as our primary uh, way of making a, a determination about which strategy to, pers to pursue. However, um, we know that can't be the only consideration uh, because we are also faced with reducing CO2. And so based on those other intermediate products in the final in the production of our final finished goods products that go out to the market, we also need to trace and tr uh, the contribution of each one of those intermediate steps through the CO2 that they produce so that we can get some sort of total CO2 burden uh, that gets generated over the horizon, the time horizon of the, of the, uh, the strategies that we're considering. Now, again, you'll notice that this um, influence diagram, actually, let me switch over to the in, uh, analytica model. Um, You'll notice that some of these nodes are also the types of ellipses that I described would carry simulation or Monte Carlo kind of uh, information behind them. They represent the uncertainties that we face uh, as we consider the elements of this part of the model. The key pieces of this model are the regional sourcing mix. That is, um, as we consider uh, let me open this up. As we consider where our aluminum is coming from within the world, we also want to consider what source of energy is used to generate the, the prime aluminum or that aluminum that doesn't contain recycled aluminum. Remember, because the prime aluminum is the aluminum that basically costs us the most in terms of energy as well as CO2 footprint. And then for each one of those, we will also be considering uh, sources of prime that come from coal generation. On average, we consider that coal requires or produces about 21.1 tons of CO2 per ton of finished product. So when we look at a ton of finished goods that comes out of this production process, 21 tons of CO2 are produced. Oil and gas are slightly less. Gas is about a little bit more than just half of the coal. Gas and hydro are even better. Of course, nuclear is probably about the best. These will go into uh, the calculation of the overall CO2 burden, and that CO2 burden actually over the horizon gives us an output that looks a bit like this. So each one of these strategies is responsible not only for producing net value back to us as a company and to our shareholders, but they are also responsible for generating a certain amount of CO2. Now, when I go back to my value calculations and compare that CO2 production to the overall net present value that's generated, as you can see, not only do we have curves associated with the net present value and the CO2 production, but when we throw them up against each other in a scatter plot, we see that it's a little difficult 
to clearly see which strategy produces the most value as well as the least amount of CO2. Now, a little giveaway, you can already see that one of these strategies, uh, in fact, seems to produce not just a, a net increase in CO2 as these others are, but this particular strategy actually seems to reduce the overall CO2 uh, compared to uh, all the other alternatives we have, and, and especially compared to our baseline. However, if this were in another situation in which these were not so distinct from each other, we need another way to actually calibrate or to think about um, how to trade off a dollar of net present value versus a ton of CO2 produced in equivalent terms. So that will be the, the next part that I'll want to discuss with you. In fact, I'll just skip back over to the presentation just to quickly sh uh, show you where we are. The next thing is I want to come up with a way or to think about a way that I can do this equivalence type calculation. And I'm going to do that by reflecting back on the, the carbon credit market in Europe. And then I'm going to convert that into dollars in the end. So let me discuss briefly how I do that. If you'll notice down here, I have a little CO2 calculation module. And here I've created a, uh, a set of calculations that start off with the weekly carbon prices for a carbon credit market, uh, for the carbon credit market in Europe. Now, these, when I look at these prices over time, as you can see, they've evolved from reaching a, a peak back around 2009 or so, um, or middle uh, 2008, I'm sorry declined and picked back up again. From here, from those weekly prices, I then calculate what the weekly returns would be, convert that to daily returns, uh, and then I calculate a cumulative probability distribution, uh, as you can see right here, for those returns uh, over that approximately 12-year uh, horizon. I'm going to take that empirical CDF and I'm going to turn that now into a distribution and I will generate from that uh, empirical CDF uh, a simulated set of returns for the next 10 years. So every single day I'm going to generate a range of possible returns and I'm going to use that then to create a CO2 forward-looking price curve. So starting with approximately the last price we had in time from when I, I gathered this data, it shows that the price, the CO2 price, the credit price is evolving over time, as well as the overall uncertainty for what that price might look like. Now, this by the way, is a little bit of a problem for us because we don't participate in buying European credits. So what I really want to do is to come up with a way to think about what would that be, what would that price be uh, if I were to consider that as something more like a shadow price to us. In other words, instead of actually thinking about buying a credit in the future to offset um, the production of CO2 that we generate in our production process. What if I look at it from the point of view of that price actually represents sort of a make versus buy decision that other people are considering as they think about how to manage their own CO2 production. And so what that is evolving to is a kind of a clearing price, if you will, uh, that represents what other people would do uh, in terms of how much they're willing to pay to buy a credit versus do the things that actually reduces the overall carbon footprint that they generate themselves. Now, I want to take the time element out of this. So instead of matching our production forecast against the future price and time, I'm going to calculate the marginal probability 
distribution over time and get a distribution that lets me uh, use that against my future aluminum uh, mass uh, finished goods mass production to create a kind of a cost that I should burden my overall uh, net present value with. So the average value turns out to be about $60.52. But uh, if I look at that in the cumulative probability terms, uh, what that's saying is that given the underlying probability over the next 10 years, we should see something, uh, the price of carbon credits in terms of euros, fall out 80% of the time, somewhere between $90 uh, a ton uh, to around uh, 30 something dollars a ton, about $35, 30, $37 a ton. Now, we would pay for these in dollars, so we need to know this in dollars, and I've more or less repeated this same process, not for the carbon price market, but for the European exchange on US dollars. So if I calculate that, and do the same sort of calculation, I get a distribution that says, you know, overall, I should, uh, we should see the exchange rate in time be somewhere between, you know, $1.50 uh, per euro uh, down to possibly 95 cents per euro. So if I apply this distribution to my European shadow price distribution, what I get overall is a price distribution that I want to call my discount price, and I'm, uh, and this will range somewhere between $40 a ton all the way up to potentially uh, $107 a ton. Uh, that is with an 80th percentile prediction interval. Now, I want to point out and, and sort of emphasize, this price is not something that we will pay out of pocket. So in a sense, this is a, this is a shadow price or a, uh, a non-cash expense to us. And so I'll have to treat it in that way. Uh, I can't necessarily take it out of uh, our P&L as an actual expenditure. So what I will do though is to take that price and I will apply it against the annual CO2 burden. And I will then from that calculate a total CO2 burden in terms of dollars uh, against the uh, the actual uh, production of net present value in my model. So these curves will be applied to my strategy net present value, and they will create a discount against my original net present value. So let's look at these curves again. So these curves originally represented what net present value I would generate with these uh, alternative strategies I could pursue without regard to CO2 production. And then if I burden each one of these strategies value with that CO2 value as a shadow price, again, as a non-cash expense, it reprioritizes my attention on other strategies. So in fact, let's look at this in terms of a expected value or mean value of the original net present values against the new values. So originally, the original net present values, their averages would be represented by these uh, light brown bars. The strategy, the two strategies that were really competing uh, as alternatives to each other uh, was this keep the XYZ but grow bicycle and AF, uh, AFS, AFH share versus the exit the XYZ but grow bicycle and AFH share. Uh, and that would be sub strategy B too. So these two are the, the key ones that we'd focus our attention on normally. However, these other two might represent uh, second and third best alternatives. If for some reason we don't, we find reasons that we can't necessarily pursue these. So this would be my order of attention. And of course, as we already discussed, those other curves that were on the far left, uh, these would have been discarded uh, anyway. 
However, once I include the shadow price burden of the CO2 as calculated uh, from the proxy of the European CO2 credit market, I heavily discount this strategy. In other words, it produces so much CO2 that it is heavily burdened with that shadow price and it completely rearranges my prioritization from the original set that I had. And you'll notice that this strategy is now uh, really the second place strategy by comparison to what was originally my third place strategy. That third place strategy has elevated itself to be the most competitive strategy to consider. That sort of brings us to the uh, end of my discussion. I wouldn't necessarily suggest that this methodology that I've developed is the right way to do this. This is the way that we've sort of started to begin thinking about how we can take um, the existing value that the overall market is placing on carbon reduction, also reflecting their own values and preferences as a social cost, and to readjust our thinking about where we should be allocating our own investment dollars, not just to generate positive value returns to the shareholders, but to also reduce the overall burden of the effect of our production processes on the rest of the earth and to all of us uh, that live here. So I hope you found that uh, helpful. Uh, and I hope it helps to spark some thoughts in your own mind about how you might use similar techniques to uh, assess the value uh, of your own carbon reduction efforts, uh, as well as to give you some insight into what the actual burden is that maybe your own company is generating on the overall environment with its own CO2 production. Thank you again for your attention. Uh, I hope this has been helpful, and I hope this also um, spur some conversations internally. Likewise, I would actually say that if you have some suggestions for me, uh, please offer those and maybe we can start a dialogue about how we can all do this in a much better fashion. Thank you again and I look forward to uh, hearing from you all.